Welcome to Students of the Internet. Today I will be informing you about the basic components of living systems. To discover and learn more about living systems, scientists use microscopes. A microscope is an instrument which enables you to magnify an object hundreds, thousands, and even hundreds and thousands of times. The first types of microscopes to be developed were the light microscopes in the 16th to 17th century. From that point, microscopy has been developed and improved. By the mid-19th century, scientists for the first time had access to microscopes that had a high enough level of magnification to see individual cells. This led to cell theory being developed, which states that both plants and animal tissue are composed of cells, which are the basic units of life and also that cells only develop from existing cells. Although many more effective types of microscope have been invented, the light microscope is still widely used due to being widely available and relatively cheap. Because of this, it is important to know how one works. A compound light microscope has two lenses, the objective lens, which is placed near the specimen, and an eyepiece lens, through which the specimen is viewed. The objective lens produces a magnifying image, which is then magnified again. This allows for a much higher magnification than in a standard light microscope. These microscopes are most likely what you use in class. If that is not the case, or you'd like a reminder, I will now explain how to use them. First, you must prepare your sample. This can be done in many different ways. As a dry melt, where solid specimens are cut very thinly, which is often known as sectioning and placed on the centre of a slide with a covered slip on, or as a wet mount, where specimens suspended in liquid are placed on a slide and the cover slip is placed on at an angle, or as a squash slide where a wet mount is prepared and a lens tissue is used to press down the cover slip, or finally as a smear slide where the edge of a slide is used to smear the sample creating a thin even coating on another slide. When you use the microscope, the sample will be illuminated from below. However, it is often hard to see any components in a cell, as they have low contrast, because most cells do not absorb light. So to increase contrast, staining can be used with positively charged and negatively charged stains, highlighting cell components or the outside of the cell to provide contrast. When using a microscope, people often use the terms magnification and resolution. Despite being used often together, they are very different. Magnification is how many times larger the image is than the actual size of the object being viewed. It is important to know that simply magnifying an object does not increase the amount of detail being seen. For this, resolution is needed. Resolution is the ability to see individual objects as separate entities. Resolution is limited by the diffraction of light and can be increased by using electrons which have much shorter wavelengths than light. Before I expand on that, there is one other thing I'd like to outline on magnification, and that is, often in exam, you will need to find the magnification that is being used, but only have the image size and the actual size of the object. To do this, you use the equation of magnification equals size of image over the actual size of object. So, I promised I would expand on how to improve the resolution in microscopes using beams of electrons. This was first done in the middle of the 20th century with the invention of the electron microscope. In electron microscopy, a beam of electrons with a wavelength of less than one nanometer is used to illuminate the specimen. They can produce images of up to 500,000 times magnification and still have a clear resolution. Due to electrons having such small wavelengths, much more detail of the cell ultrastructure can be seen. However, unlike light microscopes, Electron microscopes are very expensive and need to be kept in a very controlled environment. There are also problems with artefacts, which are structures that are produced due to the preparation process. There are two types of electron microscope, the transmission electron microscope and the scanning electron microscope. In the transmission electron microscope, a beam of electrons is transmitted through a specimen and focused to produce an image. This has the best resolution with a resolving power of 0.5 nanometers. In a scanning electron microscope, a beam of electrons is sent across the surface of a specimen and the reflected electrons are collected. The resolving power is from 3 to 10 nanometers, so the resolution is not as good, but 3D images can be produced. On screen, you can hopefully see a table summarizing the differences between light and electron microscopes 
showing the huge magnification and resolutions the electron microscope has, yet how expensive and complex it is. This probably explains to you why electron microscopes are rarely found in schools. You might remember I mentioned the term artefacts earlier, and I am aware I might have made it seem like they are only found in electron microscopy. This is not true, as the definition is a visible structural detail caused by processing the specimen and not a feature of the specimen. This means that bubbles that get trapped in the cover slip in light microscopy are also artefacts. Wow, that is a lot of microscopes I hear you exclaim, and you would be right, but we are still not done. The final type of microscopy I would like to tell you about is laser confocal microscopy. This is actually a very developed type of light microscopy. A laser scanning confocal microscope moves a single spot of focused light across a specimen. This causes fluorescence from the components labelled with a dye. The emitted light from the specimen is then filtered through a pinhole aperture. Although, only light radiated from the distance that gives the sharpest focus, or the focal plane, is detected. This is because light emitted from other parts of the specimen would reduce the resolution and cause blurring. An important fact of laser scanning microscopy is that it is non-invasive and is currently used in the diagnosis of diseases of the eye. Microscopes have not only made cells visible, they have also allowed us to see what is inside them. Because of this, I will now be informing you of the two cell types, eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotes are made up of a single prokaryotic cell with a simple structure of just a single undivided internal area called cytoplasm. Eukaryotic cells make up multicellular organisms like animals, plants and fungi. Yeah, that includes you and me. Eukaryotic cells have a more complicated internal structure containing a membrane-bound nucleus and cytoplasm, which contains many membrane-bound cellular components. It is in this cytoplasm that chemical reactions take place. In eukaryotic cells, the cytoplasm is divided into membrane-bound compartments called organelles. There are a number of organelles that are common to all eukaryotic cells. The first one I will talk to you about is the nucleus, which contains coded genetic information in the form of DNA molecules. DNA directs the synthesis of all proteins required by the cell. On the nucleus, you have the endoplasmic reticulum, which is a network of membranes enclosing flattened sacs called cisternae. There are two types of endoplasmic reticulum, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which is responsible for lipid and carbohydrate synthesis and storage, and the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which is ribosomes bound to the surface and is responsible for the transport and synthesis of proteins. Ribosomes themselves are organelles, created in the nucleolus in the nucleus. They can be free-floating in the cytoplasm, as well as attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. They are the site of protein synthesis, so can also be found in mitochondria, chloroplasts, and even prokaryotic cells. Mitochondria are essential organelles in almost all eukaryotic cells. They are the site of the final stages of cellular respiration. The number of mitochondria in a cell is generally a reflection of the amount of energy it uses. Mitochondria have a double membrane. The inner membrane is highly folded to form structures called cristae. The membrane forming the cristae contains the enzymes used in aerobic respiration. The fluid interior of a mitochondria is called the matrix. Also, mitochondria actually contain a small amount of DNA called mitochondrial DNA, allowing them to produce their own enzymes and reproduce themselves. Another type of organelle is the vesicle. These are membranous sacs that have storage and transport roles. They consist of a single membrane with fluid inside. Lysosomes are specialised forms of vesicles that contain hydrolytic enzymes. They are responsible for breaking down waste material in a cell, including old organelles. They are very important to the immune system as they are used to break down pathogens ingested by phagocytic cells. Another feature that is present throughout the cytoplasm of all eukaryotic cells is the cytoskeleton. It is a network of fibres necessary for the shape and stability of a cell. Organelles are held in place by the cytoskeleton. It also controls cell movement and the movement of organelles in a cell. The cytoskeleton has three components. Microfilaments, which are contractile fibres formed from the protein actin, 
These are responsible for cell movement and also cell contraction during cytokinesis, which is the process in which cytoplasm of a single eukaryotic cell is divided into two daughter cells. I'll make a video of this in the future and add an annotation. But for now, the second component is the microtubules. These are globular tubulin proteins that polymerize to form tubes that are used to create a scaffold-like structure that determine the shape of the cell. They also act as tracks for the movement of organelles such as vesicles around the cell. The final component of the cytoskeleton is the intermediate fibers which give the cell mechanical strength to help maintain the integrity. Apart from these three components, there is one other that is part of the cytoskeleton that is, the centrioles. These are present in most eukaryotic cells, with the exception of flowering plants and most fungi. They are composed of microtubules. Two centrioles form the centromere, which is involved with the assembly and organisation of spindle fibres during cell division. Centrioles are also thought to have a role in the positioning of flagella and cilia. Well, it seems only logical that I now tell you about flagella and cilia. They are both extensions that protrude from cells. Flagella are longer than cilia, but cilia are usually present in greater numbers. Flagella are used primarily to enable the cell to move. In some cases, they are also used as a sensory organelle, detecting chemical changes in the cell's environment. Cilia can be mobile or stationary. Stationary cilia have an important function in sensory organs, like the nose. Mobile cilia beat in a rhythmic pattern and create a current to move fluids or objects to adjacent cells. An example of this would be the trachea, where they are used to move mucus away from the lungs. A very key function of the cell is to synthesize proteins, whether for internal use or secretion. A large proportion of the cell is required for this process. The cytoskeleton, endoplasmic reticulum, and ribosomes have a role in protein synthesis, as I've explained. But one organelle I haven't described is the Golgi apparatus. This is very similar in structure to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. It is a compact structure formed of cisternae. It does not contain any ribosomes, as its role is to modify proteins and package them into vesicles. Now I've described the organelles of the cell used in protein production and all the organelles I know, I can now outline protein production itself. Make sure you listen out to the organelles that you've already heard. First, proteins are synthesized on ribosomes on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. They then pass into the cisternae and are packaged into transport vesicles. These vesicles then move towards the Golgi apparatus via the transport function of the cytoskeleton. The vesicles then fuse with the cis face of the Golgi apparatus and the proteins enter. The proteins are then structurally modified before leaving the Golgi apparatus from its trans phase. These vesicles may be secretary vesicles which move towards and fuse to the cell surface membrane, releasing the proteins by exocytosis, or they may be lysosomes which stay in the cell. Plant cells have all the cellular components we've just talked about. However, there are some structures that are only seen in plant cells. The first structure I will inform you of is the cellular cell wall. Unlike animal cells, plant cells have rigid structures. This is because of the cell walls surrounding the cell surface membrane. Plant cell walls are made of cellulose, which is a complex carbohydrate. Cell walls are freely permeable, so molecules can pass in and out of the cell through the cellulose wall. The cell walls of a plant give it shape. The rigidity is due to the contents of the cell pressing against the cell wall. This supports the cell and the plant as a whole. The cell wall also acts as a defence mechanism, protecting the contents of a cell against invading pathogens. There are many organelles that are unique to plant cells. These are vacuoles, which are membrane-lined sacs in the cytoplasm containing cell sap. Many plant cells have permanent large vacuoles, which increase the push against the cell, maintaining a rigid framework. This is called maintaining the turga. The membrane of a vacuole is called the tonoplast. It is selectively permeable, which means that some particles can pass through, but others can't. Chloroplasts are also an organelle unique to plant cells. These are responsible for photosynthesis. Because of this, they are found in cells in the green parts of plant, such as the leaves and stems, but not in the roots. They have a double membrane structure, much like mitochondria. The fluid inside the chloroplast is called the stroma, 
They also have an internal network of membranes, which form the flattened sacs called thylakoids. Several thylakoids stacked together are called a granum. The grana, which is multiple granum, are joined by membranes called lamellae. It is the grana that contain the chlorophyll pigments where light-dependent reactions occur during photosynthesis. Like mitochondria, chloroplasts also contain DNA and ribosomes, so are therefore able to make their own proteins. Animals, plants and fungi are all complex multicellular organisms. The cells that make up all these organisms are eukaryotic. You may remember I said I was going to inform you about eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are present in great numbers and live in an incredibly diverse range of habitats. Prokaryotic cells can be classified into two evolutionary domains, archaea and bacteria. Prokaryotic cells may have been among the first forms of life on Earth. They first appeared around 3.5 billion years ago, when the Earth was a very hostile environment. This might explain the ability for these cells to be such extremophiles, being able to live in hydrothermal vents and salt lakes. Prokaryotes have many differences to eukaryotes, such as their DNA is not contained within the nucleus, and there is generally only one molecule of DNA, called the chromosome. However, despite this, the structure of the DNA itself is very similar to how it is in eukaryotes. Some other differences in eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells. Ribosomes are much smaller in prokaryotes. Unlike plant cells, cellular cell walls, prokaryotic cells have a cell wall made from peptidoglycan, also known as murine. The final difference I will tell you about is that the flagella of prokaryotes is thinner than the equivalent on eukaryotic cells. Please see the table on screen to remind you of all the differences. Hi, this is Seb from Revise. I hope you've found this video as useful as I have. If you have any suggestions for future videos or any ones that you want me to specifically make, please leave a comment below. Otherwise, if you're new to the channel, please subscribe. And as always, keep revising. Revise. Revision expressed virtually and internationally to supplement education.